Hallo, guten Abend meine Damen und Herren und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums. Mein Name ist Laura Teixeira von der Kinoabteilung. Ich freue mich sehr, dass so viele heute gekommen sind für den Vortrag von Erik de Kuiper bei der Reihe Die Erfindung in der Formen, das Kino von Chantal Ackermann. Ich äh, will nicht so lange reden, ich wollte nur ganz kurz ein paar Hinweise ähm, hier. Ähm, und zwar äh, für die Leute, die äh, den Film heute äh, gefallen und nochmal den Film sehen wollen oder einfach weiterempfehlen wollen, wir wiederholen den Film und natürlich ohne Vortrag am Mittwoch, am ähm, 14.11. um 18 Uhr. So, wir versuchen das jetzt bei der Lecture-Reihe, nicht alle Filme werden wiederholt, aber manche Filme versuchen wir auch in einem zweiten Termin anbieten zu können für die Leute, die den Film ähm, nochmal oder einfach den Film sehen wollen. Dann, ganz, ganz Besonderes haben wir äh, für November auch äh, als Begleitprogramm die äh, Möglichkeit äh, oder die, ja, genau, die Glück gehabt, dass wir auch zwei Filme von Eric de Kolper selbst, der auch Filmemacher ist, ähm, zeigen zu dürfen. Das wird Ende November stattfinden hier im Kino. Also das heißt, am ähm, 24.11. zeigen wir Casta Diva, seinen ersten Film. Und am 28.11., auch um 18 Uhr, bei den Filmen, bei den Vorstellungen, zeigen wir Naughty Boys. Das ist dann der zweite Film. Das ähm, wird sicherlich spannend. So, ich lade alle sehr, sehr herzlich ein für diese ähm, Vorstellungen. Und ähm, genau, und für heute Abend, äh, das Einzige ist immer wie üblich, wir haben, wir haben einen Vortrag, dann eine kurze Pause, dann äh, der Film und nachher äh, ein paar, äh, haben wir die Gelegenheit, Fragen hier zu stellen. Und, äh, aber ganz wichtig ist heute, dass in, der, in dieser Pause zwischen Vortrag und Film, dass alle, die rausgehen, bitte die Karte mitnehmen, sodass wir nochmal kontrollieren können für die Leute, die zurückkommen. So, das ist äh, vielleicht auch wichtig für heute. Das ist ein bisschen unüblich. Normalerweise kann man einfach raus und wieder rein, aber heute bitte die Karte nicht vergessen. Und wie gesagt, ich will nicht zu lange reden und lass uns loslegen. Und ich äh, lade Vincent Rediger sehr gerne hier vorne, sodass er unsere heutigen Gast vorstellen kann. Vielen Dank. Okay, um, I'll switch to English, since the talk is going to be in English as well. Um, uh, tonight's guest is a man of many, many talents. Uh, he is a filmmaker a screenwriter, a writer, a novelist, a musician, a curator, an archivist, and a film scholar. Um, and he excels in every one of those departments. Um, our undergraduate students know the name of our guest um, because they learn about him every year in the second meeting of our introductory course, which is dedicated to early cinema. Um, in that course, we tell the story of how one man, with the assistance of some friends, pretty much single-handedly saved the Netherlands Film Museum from being closed down in the 1980s and the early 90s and turned it into a hub of early cinema research. Um, the uh, situation was that um, the Dutch government thought that the Netherlands Film Museum was doing just the stuff a normal cinematheque was doing showing canonical films to a ever-dwindling audience of aging cinephiles. And um, they asked the film museum to sort of reinvent themselves to have a new justification for their existence. And um, uh, Eric de Kaufer's idea was to actually look into the archive and look what was there, rather than just follow through with the canonical program. And uh, the things that he and his collaborators found in the archive were, first of all, the largest coherent collection of early French films in existence in the world, as well as lots of film materials that no other archivist had ever looked at, because they were only fragments, or as Eric de Kuyper once put it, ruins of finished works. And one of the things that Eric de Kuyper and his collaborators started doing in the Netherlands Film Museum in the uh, late 80s and 1990s was putting these fragments together, the bits and pieces as they called them, into reels, into curated programs that gave these materials a new life and actually turned them, uh, if you will, into uh, elements of an art form onto itself. The Bits and Pieces project um, now consists that was the last count I made last 
Paul uh, of 623 fragments, most of them not identified, uh, put together on 56 reels of 300 meters, and these reels circulate and are shown in um, uh, festivals and uh, uh, art cinemas, um, and actually bring uh, the contents of the archive to a life that uh, it would not otherwise have. The reason why I'm telling you this is that uh, this, to me, seems to be a wonderful example of how film scholarship, curatorship, and actually artistic creation filmmaking can go together to broaden our understanding of what film as an art or non-art, if you include everything that is beyond the canon, uh, can potentially be. Um, as I said, Eric de Kuyper is also a film scholar. He was a professor of film studies at one point at the Uni University of Nijmegen before moving to the Amsterdam Film Museum. He is, as we just learned, an accomplished filmmaker in his own right. You will get a chance to uh, see some of his films here. Um, and he's a writer, and in that capacity, he has been one of the most consistent collaborators of Chantal Ackermann, um, um, actually pretty much throughout her career up until uh, about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I think. Um, there's a wonderful passage in Chantal Ackermann's um, uh, sort of autobiographical conversation monologue in the catalog that was published in connection to um, the, 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 the big exhibition in the Centre Pompidou in 2004. I briefly mentioned this last week. A book's called uh, Chantal Lacarma, Autoportrait en Cineaste. And there's actually a, pa a passage in there that relates to, to our guest tonight, where um, Chantal Lacarma uh, recalls how they met and what came out of it. Um, uh, Eric de Kuyper was uh, the host of a television program uh, on Belgian television in the early 70s, throughout the 70s, called The Andere Film. And uh, this was actually the place where Chantal Ackermann's first film, Salt Maville, was first screened. So that was actually, the, in a way, the world premiere, the first public screening of that film. And out of that uh, meeting uh, came a lifelong um, uh, friendship and working relationship that uh, we're going to hear about tonight. And I just want to read out a passage from, uh, from Chantal Ackermann's report on that meeting and its consequences. And maybe Eric later can comment on it and tell us what, which part of it is true and which isn't. Um, so here's what Chantal Ackermann had to say. I'm going to read the French and then translate it. Avec Eric, on parle de tout, on a ri de tout, on était toujours d'accord, sauf sur la littérature. Uh, so with Eric, uh, we, we talked about everything, we laughed about everything, we were always uh, of the same mind about everything except for literature. Il avait décidé qu'il n'aimait pas les romans. Il ne lisait que des livres théoriques et des journaux. Moi, je lui disais, lis au moins Proust. So he had decided that he didn't like novels and uh, he only read theoretical books and, and newspapers. And I told him, you should at least read Proust. Un jour, il est tombé malade. J'étais à New York, il a lu Proust. Et il dit lui-même que euh, c'est là, sans doute, cela, sans doute, l'a poussé à écrire. So one day he fell ill when, she, when I was in New York and he started reading Proust and that changed his mind about literature, is what she said. And he himself says that Proust pushed him to become, or to, to start writing and to uh, à écrire toutes sortes de choses, mais surtout des romans, um, to write various things and... Uh, most of all, novels. Um, so I was particularly happy in the light of this passage that uh, Eric chose La Captive as the film that he wants to talk about tonight, uh, because apparently Proust was the one that put you in agreement on the one point where you didn't have an agreement before, apparently, which was literature. Um, Eric, thank, thank you very much for coming here tonight, uh, and please welcome together with me, Eric de Capri. Oh, 
ich möchte äh, mich bedanken für die Einladung von, Einladung von äh, Vinzenz äh, und, his, und sein Team und auch das Filmmuseum und ihres Team. Äh, und das erinnert mich daran auch, dass ich ein Frankfurter bin und geblieben bin. Ich äh, war schon hier so, so oft bei Heide Schluppmann und Carola Gramann und wir haben so schöne Monate gehabt, wenn ich diese Gastprofessur hier gegeben habe äh, damals und auch ein schönes Buch ist daraus gekommen, De Fruchte La, zu früh, zu spät, leider nicht auf Deutsch übersetzt, aber vielleicht kann es noch kommen. So, thank you very much. And now in English. Dear friends, thank you very much, Vincent. And uh, one little correction. One, you said one man, but it was one, one, one man and a woman, because uh, Hoes Blotkamp was really my uh, big partner in this enterprise in Amsterdam. So uh, we should not forget her. Without her, we couldn't have done it. So, uh, I'm very glad I can speak about La Captive and my work with Chantal on it. What astonished me always in filmmaking is that you need so many words, so many writing around a visual medium. It's incredible before the film and after the film, words, words, words. Especially, of course, uh, feature films. Documentary is something different. But for feature films, you need words. First of all, this horrendous thing, a pitch. I think it's uh, uh, invented by the uh, American independents say what your film is about in two phrases, in two lines. Hollywood didn't need that. Hollywood say, yeah, it's a boy meets a girl. That's the pitch of every Hollywood film. No, but the independents wanted to sell their films with pitches. It's horrible. Another horrible thing is, uh, you have to write it, is motivation. Why do you want to make this film? And how will you make it? And so on and so on. It's terrible. Words, words, words about something which is not made. It's just in your imagination. And is but very necessary, it seems, for uh, the institution, the grants, the producers, and so on. Of course, then you have the script. That's something different. A script, well, you need a script for the shooting, of course, but also the script is like the motivation. You need it because you have to sell this film to producers, co-producers, to institutions who give grants, uh, to actors or actresses and so on. For sometimes also for the team, you need something written. It must be written. Words, words, words all the time. So, uh, yeah. But the script is just a script, you know. And you have wonderful scripts. And I think Chantal had a, a, a few very good scripts who were never from for films who were never made. You have wonderful scripts for films who are not that wonderful. Chantal made a lot of them too, I think, I'm afraid. And you have very lousy scripts and very good films made by them. So a script is just a script. I worked for a uh, four and a half 
scripts of Chantal. Uh, two of them were never made. It's a script of a very ambi ambitious script for uh, an, the two novels by Isaac Bashevich Singer, who is a Jewish writer, Nobel Prize winner, and I think forgotten. Uh, I think it's a very good classical novelist, a very strong novelist, but forgotten. It was a very ambitious project. It, the film was never made. The script, I think, is quite good. Another one uh, was um, Cherie, the Colette novel. And uh, Chantal Ackman wanted not only to do the Chéri, the first part, but also the second part, La Fin de Chéri, which is less well known and uh, was a combination of both novels. Uh, but we discovered uh, that uh, all the rights of the work of Colette were blocked by the Americans. I don't know what they wanted to do with it, but anyway, uh, a few years later, uh, Stephen Frears made Cherie, a film Chantal and I didn't like at all, of course. We wanted to do Cherie uh, with uh, Catherine Deneuve, and in a modern setting, not in a historical setting. That's one of the other important things I will talk about it. Another script uh, which was never finished, that's one of the halves, I'm like Otto Mezzo, a half, was Patricia Highsmith, The Price of Salt. And we could not finish it because we, well, we didn't know about rights. Maybe the rights were blocked too. Um, we could not finish it because we didn't find a good solution for uh, the child in it. So we were not happy with the child. And... Uh, then, of course, later the film was made by Todd Haynes uh, under the title Carol. And I had the feeling that he accepted uh, the child and the plot of um, Patricia Highsmith, which we had problems with. An ending, well, the ending of La Captive was uh, difficult too, and I will tell you about it after you have seen the film. So this lecture will be in two parts, with an extra after it. So, uh, four and a half films for which I am credited, but, you know, credits... Uh, I am credited for films I did nothing for. I was not involved, of very, not very much involved in. Je tue il elle, I have a credit. I don't remember what I have done on Je tue il elle. Just, uh, yeah, uh, maybe had some conversation with Chantal, but I had a lot of conversations with her. Uh, other films, I am not credited, uh, but I did a lot. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, for instance, um, Les Rendez-vous d'Anna. Uh, uh, I discussed a lot the script. I discussed a lot the casting. Helmut Grimm was one of my suggestions. Uh, uh, the location scouting. I went with her for four or five days in the Ruhr Gebiet, which I knew better than she knew. But... I'm not credited, but that's normal, you know, it's uh, like that in film. So it's, uh, film is teamwork and uh, it's sometimes very difficult uh, to, to decide who did one. Well, the, one, the films where I'm credited, I have rights for, I was paid for it. So uh, that's one of the, the factual things uh, <laughs> which are uh, straight. Uh, yeah, what is a script? A script uh, is important for uh, to have grants to find money. 
And uh, I tell you a very interesting story, I think, about Jeanne Dillman. It's 100% true. Uh, Chantal, uh, at the time, lived in uh, our place in Brussels, Rue Crespel. Uh, behind the corner was the shop of her mother. And um, I did some selling in the shops when Chantal was too lazy to go. Uh, she asked me, can you go to the shop and sell these dreadful clothes uh, to the, the customers? So um, she, she wrote um, Jeanne Dillman. I didn't know. I read it and I found, I said, yeah, it's okay. It's average, but it's okay. And uh, then, I remember very well, one day she came up and she said, she cried on the staircase and it was on the landing of uh, my flat there. I said, I got the money, I got the money, I got the money, I got the money. But I don't want to make this film. I don't like the script. I said, I think you're right. It's very average. It's, uh, yeah. No, I don't want to make the screen. You know, I want to make, and she was explaining me at that moment, Jean Dillman, as it became Jean Dillman. So she made a totally different film than what uh, she got the grant for, uh, which was the script of Jean Dillman. So it would be very, I'm very proud. <laughs> I'm very proud because I say, yes, you're right. Your script was lousy and average. And I think your ID, I didn't understand very well what you wanted to do, but I think your ID is quite good, you know. Uh, she made uh, Je Tu Hilel before. So I say, I think, yeah, why not try it? Why not do it? Of course, the film was made as Jean Dillman, and one commission did not compare, eh? as always, did not compare the script with the film. Thank God. They didn't say, ah, you didn't shoot the script, you send us, and you got the money for it. No, they accepted, of course, the film. So you see, it's, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's life. <laughs> that's life in the movie world. It would be interesting, of course, to try to find this original script of Jean Dillman. Eh? I don't know, it must exist somewhere in the institution who gives a grant uh, in Belgium. It must exist and to compare it, it's uh, Nice work for a student, I think. Um, so, why Proust? Uh, what uh, Vincent told was totally right. At that time, uh, I, uh, I didn't want to read novels. Uh, I, uh, I, I had enough fiction in films I went to see two or three films a day at the Cinémathèque in Brussels, you know, and um, I had enough fiction and uh, I uh, wanted non-fiction, to read non-fiction. Later it, it changed. Uh, I'm, I became a big novel reader, but at that time it's true what Chantal uh, said and uh, what you uh, quoted that uh, I didn't want to, and I read uh, Proust. I didn't finish it at that time. Uh, it was the, uh, uh, the early 70s, eh? yeah, the early 70s. But then I reread it later when I was reading uh, novels again, and, um, and I, uh, of course, was very much involved in uh, the Proust. Thing. And when she asked me uh, if I would like to um, to work with her on La Captive, uh, on a Proust, I said yes. I uh, I just finished 
finished it and uh, I'm very interested and I hoped, I expected that it would be about the first books, which for me are my preferences. But she said, no, 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 I just, I want just to concentrate on uh, the, the relationship uh, Marcel-Albertine. In most of the part is in uh, La Prisonnière, in the volume La Prisonnière. I say, okay, uh, it's a very good idea, uh, I like it too, so uh, I'm co-writer uh, and uh, I accept it. Um, I accepted quite well what she wanted to do, um, because we have affinities on two uh, levels, I think, very strong affinities, uh, autobiographical, all the things we do have to do with our life, in a way. And the second aspect, daily life, the tribal banalities of life. Um, I studied philosophy too, and I was very bad at it, because in philosophy it was always freedom, God, and so on. It had nothing to do with, oh, uh, Zelters, uh, natural. And so uh, you know the, the everyday things which uh, interested Chantal very much, and the autobiographical uh, aspect of it. What's what feeling about it? Uh, I quite understood. I understood quite well what she wanted to do about this relationship, because we both liked very much vertigo and Marnie. Yeah. This was a big uh, reference for us, uh, Hitchcock. Eh? Of course, that's not original, but for us it was the relationship Marcel-Albertine uh, and this kind of movie would have been in the atmosphere of Marnie or uh, uh, Vertigo. And directly, you see it, you understand it, contemporary, contemporary not a historical Proust, not a Belle Epoque. Yeah. No, it, what's happening now, it, it, that's what for uh, Chantal always very important. She had no feeling at all for historical things, costume, dramas, props, scenery, and so on. No, not at all. And when we uh, worked on Cherie by Colette, which is also a Belle Epoque thing, uh, <coughs> of course, she saw it as a, as a contemporary uh, subject. And the same was directly we had no problem with the historical context of Proust, which is quite daring in a way. Eh? But on the other side, Bresson did it also with Dostoevsky in La Femme Douce and so on. So <coughs> it's a, a, a normal approach if you don't have uh, the feeling for that or if what's for you the most important are uh, the emotions, because that's also, with, uh, as for me, uh, it's about drama is more important for us than uh, uh, plot. We are not interested in plots. Uh, we don't understand plots most of the time. I don't understand plots very well. But we understand the emotions, the drama, very well. That's what's for us the most important thing. So uh, in uh, La Captive, it was certainly also that. Um, yeah. So her lecture of Proust was very simple and direct. It was, I must say, very easy. Uh, to adapt, 
you know she because she 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 f went directly to in this you know Proust in this jungle directly to what would be an Ackerman moment you know uh, without problem of uh, should I no no uh, that's what we uh, well, I must say uh, just in between that uh, I was amazed how uh, how logical her mind was uh, uh, when Emil and I, Emil Pop and I, we were staying at her place in Paris because we we did our uh, uh, PhD uh, at Ecole Pratique, and uh, we were writing. Emil and I was writing uh, uh, very difficult uh, semantic, logical semantic work with Gremas. Uh, and we asked her to read it, you know. She understood it. She could follow it. Something which is v quite difficult, you know. But she had a very clear logical intuition about these things. Of course, she didn't understand all. And she, she studied till 18 years, you know. She, she was not an academic, on the contrary. She was very much... Uh, a little against all academism in university and so on. But uh, she, she had this kind of logical structuralist uh, intuition, which in this case of Proust, of course, is very helpful because you can throw away everything you don't need and you don't like. Uh, what she said, uh, I remember, it's uh, uh, Marcel, c'est moi little like uh, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, uh, Flaubert. Uh, in, in, the, in, the me, in the sense that she said she understood the writer more than the character, you know. It was Marcel Proust is like a brother for me. I understand very well, which is very strange, you know, because the world of uh, La Recherche is so different from uh, the world of Ackermann, of course. Two impressions about the writing. It was easy, very easy, and it was a great pleasure. It was a great pleasure. Choosing and selecting the parts in the novel, which interested us for the film, was totally unproblematic, you know. And rewriting, rewriting Proust, you know, it was, that was a delice. It was fantastic. And we were both so astonished, and I still am because I have read, after it I have read dozens and dozens of studies uh, on La Recherche for another uh, project. We were astonished how good the dialogues were, how fantastic uh, the dialogues of Proust are. They never mentioned that in the I never have seen it somewhere there where they say, oh my God, what a fantastic dialogue is he writing. And for us it was fantastic, you know, we had just to cut sometimes, to erase or uh, to add something, but uh, you could use the dialogues just like that, you know. That's... Uh, um, we worked always uh, part-time, that means we worked in the morning, after letting out the dog, we discussed for an hour or two, just discussing, smoking a lot, of course, and drinking a lot of coffee, and then we were getting angry. And then in the afternoon, Chantal wrote what we had discussed in the morning. And then the next day, again, I read what she had wrote and I discussed it and we get on, on a, another scene. I never was allowed to write, to write a word. Never. Writing was her privilege. You know, okay, I accepted it, eh? uh, no problem. And she 
brought me her writing. And I say, yeah. I then I was uh, allowed to say, mm, maybe you should, we should write it like this or this or so on. But the first draft was always her writing. Very important. Uh, so in a way, I was more or less a coach, uh, trying to stimulate her imagination and always in a strict Ackerman way, which is always the way I, I, write, I work when I am a co-writer. When I am a co-writer, I write for the director. Well, in this the cases where I worked with directors, and that's also the reason why I never go on the set or the shooting, because then I become a director, you know, I say, oh, oh I should do this and oh, no, I never go to the shooting, I see the film when it's finished, or I never go to the editing neither. So I do the writing and then I finish, that was my work. And I try to, uh, to, to stimulate uh, what she wants to do, to clarify it, to give her uh, clues, to say, if I, mm, that's something which you can handle very well, no? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah let's do it that way. Um, so for these feature films, this, for the feature films, the script for her was very important. She f when she went to the shooting, um, that's what she told me, she felt free. It's written, so now I can shoot. It, on the contrary, for her non-fiction, for a documentary, where I had the impression, I was never involved in it, but I have the impression that there was no text at all, you know, she just told uh, Arte and maybe wrote one page, I want to make a film about uh, the south of the, the United States, uh, you know, how many, how much money do you need, oh, not that much, and so on, and up she went, you know, it was at that time. Or L'Autre Côté, the wonderful film about the uh, Mexican border. This where uh, her documentary uh, were made at all with I may say, without preparation. And I, it's interesting to compare, because I worked a lot with uh, a Swiss filmmaker, Jacqueline Veuve, which made a lot of documentaries. But Jacqueline Veuve, um, I worked especially on feature programs, on feature films, projects from her. But Jacqueline Veuve read dozens and dozens of books before she was uh, making her film, you know. And she made a film about uh, Salvation Army or the Swiss Army and so on. Eh? She was, and then when she was shooting, she forgot everything and she did, okay. But she was an anthropologist. She worked with Jean Rouge and of course this kind of uh, preparation for her was impor important in uh, making but the, her documentary, uh, her non-fiction films. But I, I think, uh, I don't know, because I was not involved, but Chantal never had uh, uh, clear ideas about the non-fiction she was making and wanted to make. Mm -hmm. So the script, as it was written, finished, was quite faithfully shot, you know. It's, uh, uh, when I saw the film after it, I say, well, I uh, recognize everything we had written except for two things. Uh, one scene I liked very much, which was one scene with uh, Aurore Clément, and uh, Chantal told me after it, we didn't shoot it because it was too expensive. I don't know if that's the reason. And another one uh, scene was Ed, which was not in the script. And it's a scene I don't like very much. <laughs> but, but I think the script, the film realized 
perfectly well uh, the script, which is, as I say, not always the case. Sometimes the script is better than the film. For my the next project I worked I worked on with Chantal, uh, Demain on déménage, the script was much more better than the film is. And uh, one of the reasons, one of the reasons, is I think uh, because the film was the script was quite funny, and it was a comedy, and the film is not at all funny. It's quite heavy, and uh, I understand because uh, at that time during the shooting, she, Chantal was not in very good health. And uh, to make a comedy, I have the same experience, to make a comedy atmosphere when you are not feeling well and when it's very heavy to shoot, then of course uh, you need to be a very big professional of comedy filmmakers making. So, so uh, for La Captive we talked a lot about, as always, always, uh, when I was involved, about the casting. And I must say, I, most of the time I was a little astonished by her choice. For Jeanne Dillman, of course, I was astonished uh, about uh, the choice of Delphine Seric and Jan de Korte. And uh, for Albertine in La Captive, the choice of um, Sylvie Testu, was quite uh, easy for her. She, she, she decided quite quickly that it should be this not very well-known actress. And um, with not that much experience neither. And I had film must say, yes, it's a strange choice. Because she was, Sylvie uh, Testu is a little, how to say, a little everyday French classic. So uh, it could be a, a woman who sits on a cashier at a supermarket, you know. Is that Albertine? Uh, well, I think the choice was right. And the choice is right because the coupling with Stanislas Mirar, the, the boy, the guy who plays uh, Marcel, was mm, not average neither. So the couple of these two young persons was worked very well because it was not glamorous. It was not a glamorous, it was more in more or less in a tradition of Bresson, let's say. You know, uh, normally you should have to think of Albertine and Marcel, of, uh, no. And that made the film, the contemporary look of the film, also more easy to accept. I think these are average people from today, average. These are not the characters from Proust, in a way. Uh, because Proust is a Belle Epoque character and these are contemporary, but they have affinities, which, uh, of course, the Albert, Albertine and the Marcel from Proust. So I think it's, it was a good choice, it, uh, a very good choice for the film. Very intuitive also, like Jeanne Dillman and Delphine Seric, it was Sometimes her, I think her castings were very good and sometimes not that good. Anyway, uh, yeah, to finish before showing you the film, I must say that Chantal had also two other ambitions. One ambition uh, beside making films, was to be an actress, actually. 
uh, well, from the start, from Sot Maville, from all the voiceover she did. She, she liked very much to read texts. She, uh, she wanted to be also an actress, you know. And in a way, it's a pity that no filmmaker at the time asked Chantal to play uh, in, a film, in a movie. Uh, because she had, of course, comical uh, talent, but I'm afraid that uh, in her own films, her comical aspect is too sloppy. No comical actor, from Chaplin over Buster Keaton to uh, Jerry Lewis or Woody Allen, no comical actor is sloppy. They are all very precise. So her talent, her comical talent, needed, I think, a director who could give her this, uh, this uh, neatness, this, uh, this maitrise, this uh, of uh, her talent. So that's a little uh, pity, in a way, because uh, we missed a chance to have a good, good actress in a special range, which is not average. There are not so many female comical actresses, so I think she could have been one. Another ambition, which was very profound, and I already uh, suggested it, is writing. It was her writing. She was a big reader of novels, especially. She was very, she read a lot. And, um, and she enjoyed very much. She was actually maybe more uh, a reader than a film goer. Well, anyway, at, when uh, I first met her, she had not seen that many films, not, not at all. Uh, then we went to the Cinematheque and so on, but she had already, as an adolescent, read, uh, was reading a lot of novels. So, and she wrote two very good, I think, very good, nice books. In Famille à Bruxelles et uh, Ma Mère Rie. And I, I'm sure I would, she would have liked to write more. But there was one temperamental problem. As a writer, you need a lot of discipline. You know, uh, it's, you are on your own. Of course, you need, as a filmmaker, you need discipline too. But you have a whole team. You have deadlines, you know, you have a drive from outside, so you do it. Uh, but writing, uh, you have to decide what should I write today or not, uh, or um, am I uh, not in the mood? So I think that uh, was one of the things, and that's the reason why I why she asked me, because I was her coach, you know, I say, hey, Chantal, we have to write today, okay, and, and so on. Uh, and I think so too, that uh, it's the reason why she, she was befriended, of course, with Marguerite Duras, but she was a little envious of her. Of the that Marguerite Duras was not only a filmmaker but she was also a writer, and that's actually uh, I think was one of the things she was mid missing. So, so for the end of. Uh, of the film, we, we had a problem. For the end of La Captive, there was a problem because the novel has no, the relationship has no ending. It's just like so often by Proust, then 
200 pages or 300 pages later, the character reappears, but seems to be dead. 400 pages further, the character is not dead at all, but is in a total other way uh, doing uh, uh, very pedophiliac things. So we had to finish the, the film, you know, a film needs an end. It's not like the novel of... Uh, of, uh, so we were a little uh, annoyed by it, and uh, so we say, well, anyway, for the end, we need to get out of Paris, of this apartment, La Prisonnière, La Captive, for, for Chantal, it was not La Prisonnière, but La Captive, captivated, fascinated also, not just prisoner, no, fasc in a fascination relationship. Uh, we get, get out of it, and then it will, we find a solution how they will uh, finish their relationship. But the relationship finishes, go on, starts again, go on, and so on. So anyway, uh, you say, well, let's go to the sea, let's make a kind of road movie, and let's go to the sea. I think uh, at the same time we were working on the Patricia Highsmith, which for us was most of it a road movie, uh, and that because we were working on two scripts at the same time in Normandy and uh, maybe that's the road movie of uh, Patricia Highsmith came in the fragment of road movie of uh, La Captive. And uh, anyway, I uh, propose you to see the film first and then I'll have a little extra after the film where I will uh, explain you how we solved the problem of the ending. So that's the first part of my lecture. Then we have the film and then we have an extra and then we have the questions if you have uh, questions. But we have a, an interval now. So if you are not too exhausted <laughs> Um, I will give you the extras I promised before and explain, uh, try to explain how we find a solution for the end of the film. Of course, the subject is this relation is going nowhere, <laughs> that you feel it, you see it from the beginning. So, but the film has to end somewhere. So, uh, there is no solution in the book, in uh, the novel, in Proust, uh, it just uh, goes uh, like um, often in the books of, in the book of, uh, in La Recherche, it goes, as I said, there is no real solution, but at the moment, uh, Marcel, who, here is Simon, Marcel uh, thinks, hears that uh, Albertine is dead had an accident. A few books later, it seems that she is not dead at all, dead, and so on. So it goes on. So we thought, indeed, at the end we need uh, uh, the death of uh, Albertine. And uh, we already uh, changed a little uh, the prison situation of Paris the apartment and we put both characters on the road little like in a road movie as I said and then uh, I uh, we thought well it ends it should end somewhere at the seaside at the sea with the water because in, it starts also with water so we end with water and um, I just, uh, at the time, the year before or so, I uh, spent a week 
in de Biarritz, in het fantastic hotel, uh, Hotel du Palais, which is the old palace of l'imperatrice uh, uh, Eugénie, 1850 or something like that, and where the rooms are really in the sea, you know, not on the seaside or something like that, but most of the rooms are in the sea in Biarritz. So I thought it was a good, a nice, strong image. And uh, as I told you, uh, Marnie, uh, Vertigo were already there, but of course the birds uh, were uh, somewhere in our imagination too. And I, uh, at, that, at that moment I was much involved in silent movies, early silent movies, and I discovered a film by Max Mack from 1912, 25 minutes, uh, Zweimal gelebt, which is a very beautiful film, but a very strange film. And uh, I showed to uh, Chantal, I showed you, I showed her uh, uh, the, uh, the film, especially the extract, the end of the film, and I, whenever I, had no pianist to accompany because it's a silent movie, of course. Uh, I uh, put on uh, the Isle of the Dead by uh, Shostakov, by Rashmaninov, sorry, <laughs> by Rashmaninov. So I will show you now the end of Zweimal gelebt with the music of Rachmaninov, which is, you will recognize it the same as in the film. And I said to Chantal, if you use it, you should use the version of Ashkenazi, because there are 12 or so versions of it, and I think it's the best, and it's the one she used for the film also. So I show you now the end of Zweimal gelebt, where the woman who uh, lost her mind in an accident, she is married, had a little daughter, there is an accident in the beginning. She's, she lost her mind. She is brought to the hospital, to an hospital, and uh, the doctor falls in love with her. But she doesn't remember the past. Okay, that's why she marries the doctor, and then at a certain moment, she meets by chance her husband, her ex husband, and her daughter. And that's the moment when, uh, when, where it goes to the end. So, we can see it. It's not that long. Uh, I always had the impression that uh, Hitchcock must have seen this film. Because he was in Germany in 25, and it's a film from 12, but some older films were, were still screen. But... Uh, the birds and the, the vertigo bridge and so on. So for me, it's, it's, it gives. So we, uh, of course, the uh, canoeing, the, the rowing on a, on a, on a, on a, on, a, on water is a very quite classical uh, cliche image, and you have it in a lot of films. And of course, but I think it's the first time. It's used in cinema history. Um, that was one of the um, ways to finish, to look for an end, you know. Uh, uh, and you see the references are not literary. We are references for this script came from movies. And one, especially, uh, you will not guess it, but it's uh, the 1955 version of A Star is Born uh, with uh, James Mason and Judy Garland. And that's the fragment I would like to show you now. These are, uh, Chantal would have agreed. I think these are our masters, you know, Hitchcock and here uh, George Cukor. 
you feel very small when you see that, you know, as a filmmaker, say, oh, my God, what's this? Marvelous and perfect. Okay, maybe there are questions, and uh, I'd be glad to answer whatever you want me to ask. I try to answer as best as I can. Are there already any questions from the audience, of Deutsch or the, of English? I forgot to tell you that the Isaac Bashevich single novels were uh, The Manor and the Estate. It is a, a story of the Jewish Pole, Polish Jew, sorry, who immigrate to the States at the beginning of the past century. So. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, the, the film is dedicated. Her father, Jakob Ackermann, is the father of Chautal. Yeah. Why? Because he, he, he died, I think, just before. No, not for a special content reason. No, not at all. No, no. Not as I, as far as I know. No. He was not a reader of Proust. Certainly not. Nice, um, nice man, but. Uh. So one of the things that that you told us is that once the script is finished, uh, you as her, as Jean-Tos co-author, coach is a term that you also use, <laughs> um, you're no longer involved in the process. Uh, like she takes the script and then she goes on to make the film. But what you just showed us suggests that uh, a lot of the formal decisions that go into the making of the actual film are sort of premeditated and part of the, part of the script work. I mean, uh, uh, you know, that final shot of the film, uh, I think, is a very, very powerful yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, one yeah. of my favorite that's film what, endings. That's what I say. It's uh, yeah. very, yeah. And and but but clearly you you discussed not just the structure of of the of the script and the dialogues, but you were also um, talking in terms of visual ideas and in terms of how you would f how she would film uh, the script. No, no, not really. It was not a shooting. I didn't work on the shooting script, what it is, and so on. But uh, I was very glad with the location she chose. Uh, that was not in the script. Uh, the apartment, the way it was built, and so on. All these things were not in the script. Not in the script. So in the script was for uh, eighty percent the dialogues, eh? the dialogues, and all the rest. Uh, but some things are also directly from Proust. Uh, it's marvelous uh, pages in Proust is when the two uh, lovers uh, are walking in the Bois de Boulogne and uh, their shadows, uh, it describes the, how their shadows come together. And it, uh, Chantal f uh, filmed it very well, I think, but it's, it's not an idea from Chantal, not from me. It's an idea from Proust, <laughs> but a filmic idea maybe from Proust, I don't know. So, uh, of course, a lot of things, most of it is uh, uh, Chantal, uh, you know, the, all of the visual things, the style, the uh, well, everything. Yeah? But sometimes there are very specific things where, for instance, at the end where we say, how can we do it, and so on. But of course, uh, I say the hotel, but I I miss a little <laughs> life in the room, uh, uh, you know, and so on. But after it, when the, uh, on the water, when he's coming back, on the, the water is marvelous. The last shot is really fantastic. And with the music, I think yes. so too, because yes. it becomes a melodrama, really. Mm which the film is not a melodrama, not really, but at the end you, you get something, another dimension, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's like the final final chord yeah. of a song that, that yeah, sort of yeah, opens yeah. it up again. It's what the love story could have been between uh, Simon and Ariane, you know, 
but they cannot manage this love story, which you see at the end, it, it would have been possible. Well, you feel it as a, as a spectator in your imagination. They missed their love affair. Uh, just out of curiosity and because I'm such a gossip, um, which scene did you not like? I will not tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I will not tell you. No, no, I think it's just a private thing. And yeah. right. What do you think? <laughs> uh, frankly, I have to tell well, you that, that I watched, re watched the entire did, film guessing. What did you like? Um, I was wondering whether it was the scene at the theater. Uh, the scene at the theater, yeah. yes. That, uh, that I can answer, that was cut. It, it, would, it was longer with Aurore Clément at the theater. It was much longer. And that was the, Chantal said the reason was when he grabs uh, Ariane, and, uh, it was a little longer. And Chantal said that it was due to budget, of course, in Odeon with was maybe right i don't know no that's what i was missing it was in the script okay. it's in the script but it's more extensive it's not the scene i didn't oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that uh, yes we have a question mark please thank you um I, um, I I love the film. I absolutely um, thought it was fantastic. It was my first time seeing it, but um, but I'm but I'm, I'm I can't yet say that I love the ending, um, and and so I just wonder since you explained so nicely how um, in Proust um, she lives again this kind of circularity in the pursuit of love, which is something that the film builds up so convincingly. Um, only to kind of end to me somewhat conventionally. Um, and I just wonder about that decision not to leave this notion of circularity alive at the end. If you can talk, I mean, the, the references that you gave, I mean, of course, A Star is Born, he dies sort of, you know, in the middle of the film. But, um, but if you can just, just give some more context for why there was this decision to have what seemed to me, for an unconventional film, a somewhat conventional ending. Maybe that's... Uh, 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 maybe that's a little my, uh, my uh, influence. Uh, who say, from, don't be afraid of clichés. It's not because you are an experimental filmmaker that you must be afraid of of using good cliches uh, if it works. And I, it's true, it could have finished without uh, just uh, with an open end, eh? not with this uh, death. But, uh, but for, for me, and I think maybe for Chantal too, I say, well, the film is so boring. These characters are so boring, and again, and again, and again. And now we really need. <laughs> Let's get rid of them. Then at least the audience will be awake again. The characters are really, but it's in Plus too. They are boring, boring, boring. My God. And uh, uh, and she didn't help Proust because she took uh, two actors who are not very glamorous. Mm -hmm. eh? um, so, um, and they go on and they go on and they go on. My God, it's crazy. But uh, Proust is sometimes crazy. Eh? And Chantal little too. Uh, I, in a way, maybe I am too, eh? uh, co-writer. So. So no, gonna... but you are right, it could have been another way, but I think we decided. And of course it was because I think she was, uh, she used the, the Rachmaninoff already in the beginning, you know. I think she maybe she was uh, uh, fascinated by the music to to give it another dimension to give it another 
uh, yeah, drive. I mean, the, the film, because it opens with the, the, the waves and the sea and the Rachmaninoff and closes with it, Super eight, has, yeah. has a... A, and even before the Super 8 footage, there's there's yeah. the, the, over, the, the the title sequence has yeah. this, uh, you know, it's a circular structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just going to go out on the limb here and say, is is she really absolutely dead? Yeah, that you don't know. Because, no. I mean, mm -hmm. he swims out to her and he catches her. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we have the shot where yeah, yeah. apparently she's You don't dead. know. You we don't, don't know. know. So it's a little an open end. And did he kill her or not? Uh, that's something else. Eh? We don't know. Yeah. Um, Danny, please. Yeah, it's like an American tragedy or something. Um, I wanted to ask about romanticism and Chantal Ackerman, uh, because she's a filmmaker who uh, kind of in, you know, the general history of cinema is, tends to be associated with this kind of like cold aesthetic modernism, 1970s and so on. Um, but last week we saw Almayas Folly. Yeah. Today we see La Captive. These are two films that are just drenched in that romantic tradition and kind of like, you know, not afraid to take like melodramatic mm -hmm. uh, turns um, emotionally and kind of like really ramp up the emotion. So I just wanted to ask you, like, was this something she like was consciously interested in exploring as a new avenue or was it something that was always kind of in her that she wanted to kind of get out or like what? What motivated this uh, aspect I of her work? I think uh, part of the answer is that she liked novels, and not especially uh, modern novels. She liked very much 19th century novels, so and Proust. So she liked, she had this need also to have this uh, fantasy. Uh, that's one part. And... Uh, in her features, certainly, she was always very interested in emotions, you know, really. Uh, what are emotions in here, too? What, uh, what are the emotions of a woman who is just cooking? Eh? Jeanne Dillman, who is making... Uh, what are, are, uh, even if there is nothing, uh, she, that's what she was interested in. Uh, and here about uh, jealousy, of course, the whole range of jealousy, what is jealousy, and so on. So, um, yes, there was certainly, uh, I think, a romantic uh, dimension uh, in her. And it maybe, it maybe was not uh, an accident that uh, I worked with her on this, or that she asked me to work on this kind of projects. Eh? Um, of course, for her documentaries and so on, that's a totally different uh, uh, range, uh, but I think suit and uh, 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 fantastic, beautiful documentaries she made, you know. I like them very much, but uh, yeah. That's uh, an aspect, I think, of her uh, inspiration and talent. Uh, also, uh, what she was looking for in the more lighter, the comical thing, like uh, a Divan in New York uh, or uh, La Galerie, and uh, the Mao de Ménage, the, the more lighter touch she was. Uh, fascinated by, and uh, for her it was easier to write light than to film light. <laughs> I think her uh, uh, comedies, I think La Galerie is not good at all. Uh, it could have been wonderful, but uh, she had a cast, my God. No, it doesn't work for me. But uh, the c And e even Toute une Nuit, um, also, for me, is a problem. Uh, yeah. Why? Why? Tout une nuit. Why? Because she liked Pina Bausch. And it's not, it's, she, she admired Pina Bausch very much, but she, they had a row, eh? They had a row. Uh, but, well, 
but Pina Bosch is a bad filmmaker. She made one film, it's incredible, but that's the kind of uh, kitsch. Pina Bosch was not afraid of kitsch, and was not afraid of cliches, not at all. She worked all the time with cliches. And the, I think that was a dimension Chantal didn't have. You know, this kind of, uh, this, well, Ackermann is not Bausch, and Bausch is not Ackermann, eh? but I think Toute Nuit was really, she wanted to have this kind of uh, force, uh, strength, or gravity, yeah. I was, I was actually just going to bring up Toute Nuit um, and defend it. Uh, because in, in a way you could read it as 90 minutes of pure melodrama. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of goodbyes and yeah. missed opportunities. and. You mean here? No, no, no Tutti Nui. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and just at that, you know, that would seem to me to be a film in which that register is already already present. And that's early 80s. That's like 1982, I think. So... But maybe I'm too. I should see Toute Nuit again. But yeah. I, I was not convinced. It's a long time I have seen. Okay. I like that film. Yeah? <laughs> Sorry. I like that film. You like the film? Yeah. yeah maybe I should see it again. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure that I'm right in my opinion. So. Uh, no. For La Galerie, I'm right. I think it's not. It's not a good film. No. Do we have more questions from the audience? Cannot win all the time, yeah. <laughs> questions, please. If there are no more questions, it's midnight. We can call it a day. Yeah, uh, I just maybe want to tell you something which uh, just interesting for... Um, she she always say about her uh, influences Michael Snow of course Godard born but she she was not influenced by Godard but it was a shock for her Pierre Le Fou and uh, and uh, Michael Snow and so on Bresson uh, but she uh, she some she forgets to. Uh, to mention some, uh, especially one film I know, we saw it together in uh, Oberhausen, I think, uh, uh, Die Unterdrückung der Frau von Helmut Kostad. That's an, uh, ein anderer Film, aber ich weiß nicht mehr, wie der Titel ist. Ich habe es auch nicht zurückgefunden. Ich glaube, es war... Uh, Ich habe immer gedacht, es war Winkelmann, aber es ist nicht wie, was ich von meinem Fenster aus sehe. Und das ist, ja, und das ist, äh, das ist, äh, das war ein Ackermann vor Ackermann, nicht? Äh, und äh, sie, sie, äh, she mentions äh, Werner Schröter, who was a friend, uh, in one of her carte blanche programs, she had a program with Bresson and so on, Straub, I think, of course, and uh, she mentioned Schröter, his Super 8 uh, Maria Callas film, which we saw in Cologne together. So uh, this is a dimension she, n <laughs> she doesn't mention, and I think especially for the Jean Dillman, uh, studies uh, the Costard film, uh, which you you know the Costard film, no, no. It's one hour uh, of a woman working in the kitchen, his kitchen, cooking and so on, but it's acted by men. It's the all. It's like a Jean Dillman, a masculine Jean Dillman. So uh, without commentary or something, just uh, very straight. And so it made an impact. It made, an, yeah, an, on, on all of us. Yeah, you said you you saw that film together with Chantal at Oberhausen at, at yeah, one point, yeah. and that it may have influenced her or 
sure. so sort of have given her the idea for Jean Dinman. Yes. For sure, because as I told you, the first script of uh, Jean Dinman was more uh, uh, a Belgian uh, Belle du Jour. <laughs> And uh, what's now is not a Belgian belle du jour at all, it's something else. So, uh, yeah? Yes, please. There's an element in, uh, yeah, good evening first, maybe. There's an element in the last scene that, that, that I find painful, which is that the, the female figure uh, repeats a lot the words as you like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um, is this f from the um, from Mrs. Ackermann or is it from Proust or did it just come up? I'm, I'm not sure but that uh, what I'm sure of is this repetitions that's Ackermann au contraire, au contraire, au contraire uh, yeah. That's uh, this repetition. This uh, this is typical, but it can be improved too. Eh? If you like, we. Yeah. Yeah. The image. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, come to the. She is. She is no. She has no. Uh, how to say? She is totally en enigmatic. She is totally you. She says what you want her to say. And she is doing other things <laughs> and thinking other things, but she has no, no communication at all. Uh, and that's uh, at a certain moment that's Proust, uh, that, uh, that when she says uh, to him, uh, I don't want to know what you, I, why do you ask me all the time what I think and so on? I am not interesting in what you are thinking, so I just like you. Very strange, no? I like you because you are, you are a stranger. And I accept that, that you are a stranger. Uh, so it's very extreme. It's very uh, extreme, you know, from one side to want to know everything and on the other side to, to want to know nothing about just just what to accept another person and one of the things that that she says in the in the car towards the end is when he presses her for honesty yeah, yeah. and wants to know everything and she says you know if i know more about you i love you less yeah yeah, yeah. um so there's this yeah. this balance of um secrecy and desire What? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's I. That's I'm quite sure. The end is all. The end is. Um, I think all is from Proust, as far as I remember. Uh, in the beginning, less the dialogues, but at the end, is all this. Bo, 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 so on. That's really Proust. Yeah. Uh, a moment, bitte. Ich komme. Thank you. I'm just wondering, I saw last time Almayer's um, Folly and there is um, also in this film, I'm, I just get the feeling that there's a opposition between two characters. In Almayer's uh, Folly is the father and the daughter and here are, uh, is the couple. And I feel that's uh, a bit similarity or it, it comes just in my mind. It feels like it's just um, the opposite. 
and it's like au contraire or maybe you uh, I don't get your name sorry <laughs> I'm not a student of, of, of you so um, you mentioned the special um, relation between Chantal Ackermann and her mother and they they were very close and I feel it's a bit of of a family thing or just to to be no I, it's just the opposite of something it just comes up to me uh, I'm sorry I let you answer because I haven't seen uh, La Folie yeah. Almeyer. Mm. So, uh, uh, so I cannot... Yes, I mean, by the way, it's the same actor. Yeah, As you've yeah. noticed. And um, one of the things that Ockerman said about uh, Almeyer's Folie is that she's both of those characters. Yeah, right, right. Um, but you can be uh, both and in uh, so, um the opposite of it, yeah. It, right. It's uh, I two mean, sides, yeah, sure. So, so it's it's both sides. It's a that relationship. There's a struggle of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that I that I found really remarkable about what you were telling us about the writing process is how, uh, you know, how Chantal Ackermann is is uh, has a sort of has a very logical structuralist mind, and reads Proust for what is in there. Yeah. As a as a potential Ackermann story, and um, I mean the, the the big challenge of adapting Proust, I would guess, is what you cut out and what you what what, what is left yeah. after but that. But that's fair enough. She's an artist, and sure. she can pull of out course, everything. any art, any artist can cut cut yeah. anything. But yeah. Proust is like the super monument of right. French literary culture, mm -hmm. and so far. All of the Proust uh, um, adaptations that we've had, even by people like Raoul Ruiz, have been bashed to death because you know they leave out all the good stuff. And and what is beautiful about this film is, in a way, the unscrupulousness um, with which the two of you have uh, taken out of the novel that which is important for the film. And and one of the observations that you made that I found particularly striking and actually loved is that you say nobody ever notices what a good dialogue writer Proust is and you only notice it when you strip it down to uh, to like the Ackermann right, essence right. Um, so that that's sort of a uh, a circular way of trying to answer your question I think there's I mean what, what she took out of it or what you too took out of, of the Proust novel is definitely what interests her and what, what resonates, um, you know, like she said about Almar's Folly, um, we should not engage in autobiography all the time, uh, but then again, we can't help it. Um, so there's certainly a resonance uh, with some of the themes that, that occupy her in other films, um, and that's why she apparently wanted to adapt that particular story, which is, a, again, a, a story of a, a very strong emotional dependence. Um, one thing um, that uh, we discussed before uh, your talk, actually, and I think it's worth coming back to, is that the original title of that particular prose piece is La Prisonnière, whereas uh, Chantal Ackermann consciously chose the title La Captive. Um, which has a, a, a different nuance to it. It's it's sort of a more broader uh, concept. Uh, it it eliminates the prison association, or it, it phases out the prison association, and and uh, introduces more of a sort of a mental. a mental spell type of relationship between the two. So, yeah. Can you? say something about that, how that choice came about uh, and yeah, when it happened. I, if I remember well, uh, La Captive was also a title uh, Proust uh, envisaged, uh, was thinking of. Uh, so it's, it's not just like that. No. Uh, well, of course, there was not a problem, not a problem, but not a fact, is that uh, there is a film La Prisonnière, a uh, Georges Clouseau film, who already exists, but uh, she didn't like very much the idea of the prison, you know. So uh, that's la captive is a fascination. Uh, yeah, 
the strange thing is that for me there is not very much fascination <laughs> but uh, but yeah uh, the, the jealousy thing is uh, what interested her very much at the time yeah. but um, because I said that uh, the film is very contemporary eh? it's uh, it's now but uh, I was amazed uh, when seeing it again today how belle époque it, it is all it's it's of course it's french french haute bourgeoisie you know they of course they have modern cars and so on but their apartment it's figaro it's le figaro no? it's no. the french bourgeoisie who uh, are still living like at the time of Proust in the yeah. same apartments and so on so mm. i say my god it's uh, it's still a, it's very historical mm. ambiance, uh, you know, because Paris is f f the streets from Haussmann and so the apartments, they are still Proustian. Mm. <laughs> you can film nearly everywhere you have it. So, uh, so I say, yeah, that's maybe the reason why it was so easy to do because she found also, well, Paris, it's a f very French film. It's a very French film. <laughs> it's not Belgian. <laughs> she very chic, very. Uh, it has something glacé and uh, very, uh, And I think she she found she she did well. In, uh, yeah. yeah, Benjamin said. Uh, it's very bon chic, bon genre. It's very yeah. glacé. It's like uh, like a Figaro magazine, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, something uh, the lifestyles of the French yeah, old bourgeoisie, which is uh, a subject, which is an interesting subject. Yeah. You see it in the film, but uh, which is not like her other films. That's yeah. that's for sure. I was going to say something about the cars. However, um, I mean, I think the most contemporary element in the film are the boutiques on the Place Vendôme. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 uh, yeah. So yeah. you've got the yeah, Trussardi yeah, logo yeah. and yeah, the yeah, Mickey Moto logo and. Yeah. But, but the the black car is a rolls from the fifties, yeah. and and the brown car is one of my favorite car designs. Peugeot. It's a Peugeot five oh four designed yeah, yeah. by Pinin Farina. Yeah, yeah. Very, it's a, a late seventies yeah. car, but rare and yeah. very beautiful. Uh, so there's a nineteen fifties nineteen seventies reference, and I mean Rolls Royce don't yeah. break ever, so you can drive them. <laughs> But in any case, I mean, it's an interesting uh, uh, way of of adding different historical yeah, layers and yeah, and yeah. and leaving yes, yes, So there's an ambiguity about yeah. about the time in which it is set. Yes, and then we have another question back there. They're still not. I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> that's also the, like it's just a commentary on this social class that kind of lives this ossified existence. They live inside a museum, essentially these apartments that haven't changed for 150 years. And I mean, I feel like that added so much, like by setting it in the present, but having this kind of like overbearing presence of the past throughout the entire film, like gave it a real extra quality. And and Biarritz looks like Baalbek from. I mean, that's how I would imagine Baalbek yeah. in Proust, right? That's it's the same kind of thing. By the way, latching on to that, the scene with the sculptures was that filmed in the Musée Rodin? Musée Rodin. Yeah. Um, so very late nineteenth century, and the way she interacts with the sculpture also suggests that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah please. Hi. Thank you for tonight. Um, I'm just curious about the scene with the cars at the beginning as well, and how much, to what extent, like, did you uh, art direct so much in the streets? Like the colors, for example, are all beige in those first scenes in the city, and I'm curious, like, because at the beginning there's so many colors with the swimsuits. At the end, um, I can't remember. Ah, the actress wears the, the red color, and I'm just curious to what extent. Ackerman or the art direction was kind of um, influencing the colors and 
the city streets and all this kind of stuff. Yes, I can not comment on it. Uh, you mean the colors, for instance, in the apartment? Um, no? I think specifically or in the in the in the scene with the cars at the beginning, like it made an impression how uh, all the cars were pastel and beige colors and not others. And I'm curious if that was a decision. Yeah, yeah, to make it subdued, yeah. Uh, I cannot answer that question, <laughs> sorry. I mean, those, the, the of course, all the visual things, uh, Chantal was very, of course, very uh, precise on all on the visual aspect. You see it in every mm. shot, but uh, no, I don't see special choices but in any case those w would be Chantal Ackermann's choices and and uh, you know as you as you will see going forward as we see more and more of her films uh, she's a great visual artist and stylist so uh, not not a whole lot is left to chance in those films okay so I guess uh, we can call we, it a we night. We did a good and day's work together here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody for staying. And I invite you all to the next lecture on the 15th of November with the Golden 80s. Verena Moon is going to talk to us about this musical film. I think Color is going to play a big role there as well. And I also would like to say, um, for those who haven't seen Tutu Nui that was uh, spoken about here, it will be shown on the 24th of January with Chen Seinberg. So already note that down. Um, and of course, check out all the other uh, lectures all the program is already online on our website uh, www.chantal-ackermann.de and all the program is going to be there and also all the links to the youtube videos of the lectures so in case you miss any of the films or any of the lectures i mean and yeah thanks everybody for coming and uh, see you on the 15th at the latest <laughs>